Welcome to today and thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday morning. We are all waking up to the devastating and shocking news that actor Chadwick Boseman has died. A cinematic king has fallen. This morning, Hollywood is grieving the loss of Chadwick Boseman. Following a private four-year battle with colon cancer. Making movies during and between countless surgeries and chemotherapy. When Chadwick Boseman died on August 28, 2020, the world lost one of its greatest actors. In his far too short career, Boseman had distinguished himself by playing icons and heroes of American life, Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall, and James Brown. And then of course he brought Black Panther to life in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the vulnerability and authenticity he brought to the part is a large reason why Black Panther was the first superhero film ever nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. The loss of one of the MCU's greatest heroes was felt deeply by fans. There's never a good time to suddenly lose someone, but Bozeman's death seemed especially cruel given that the Black Panther storyline was so new, with so much more to explore. With many first wave superheroes leaving the MCU like Iron Man, Captain America, and Black Widow, Black Panther was supposed to be leading the next wave. We were all looking forward to seeing what Bozeman and his other collaborators would do next. And now, in the wake of his unexpected death, and with Black Panther, Wakanda Forever only days away, that question has an entirely new meaning. What will they do? What will happen to King T'Challa? How will the series go on? While looking to the future, trying our best to guess and make wild predictions of what will happen, I thought it might be enlightening to look to the past, at all the different ways movies and television shows have moved forward in the wake of unexpected death. Perhaps there we can find some answers. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners were referred to as lords and ladies. They allow people to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land in Eddleston, Scotland, so that they can call themselves a lord or lady. Each purchase comes with an official certificate with the exact location of your spot of land, so you can actually change your name to lord or lady on your credit cards or plane tickets. If you're tired of buying your friends and family the same boring gifts year after year, buy them something fun and silly that will make their birthday or the holiday season more special. Not only are you buying a unique gift, but you're also helping established titles raise funds to support global afforestation effort groups like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. Plus, established titles plants a tree for every order, so it's really a win-win. Right now, Established Titles is having an early Black Friday sale. If you use my unique code, Entertain the Elk, at checkout, you'll get an additional 10% off. And Established Titles told me that the first 200 people who use my link will be grouped together. So in a way, we can all build our little elk gang. I call it a gang because I just found out that apparently that's what a group of elk is called. Anyways, go to EstablishedTitles.com slash Entertain the Elk to get your gift right now help the planet, and help my channel all at the same time. Welcome, welcome to another year at Hogwarts. One approach that's often used when dealing with death is recasting the character. A famous example of this could be found in the Harry Potter film series. In 2002, the great Irish actor Richard Harris passed away. At that point, he'd played Hogwarts headmaster and wizarding legend Albus Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter films. After his death, he was replaced by Michael Gambon, starting in The Prisoner of Azkaban and moving forward. With this example, the character of Dumbledore needed to be recast. Not only were the films based on an original source text, but as those familiar with Harry Potter will know, the series literally couldn't go on without Dumbledore. While it was jarring at first seeing a different actor in the role, Gambon took on the impossible task and did it admirably not by simply replicating what Harris brought to the role, but by making it his own, highlighting different aspects of Dumbledore's character and personality. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living, and above all, all those who live without love. The Star Wars franchise faced a similar problem after Carrie Fisher died in 2016. But in this instance, recasting an iconic role like Princess Leia would have felt wrong. And unlike Harry Potter, Star Wars, led by J.J. Abrams and team, were able to adapt. And what they ended up doing was actually repurposing previously unused footage. There's so much I want to tell you. Tell me when you get back. Before we started writing, we knew that Leia had to be a part of the story. 
You couldn't tell the end of the Skywalker saga without Leia. We weren't going to recast. We couldn't do a CG character. We looked at the footage we had not used in The Force Awakens, and we realized we had a number of shots that we could actually use. It was a bit like having a dozen pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and then having to make other pieces around it and paint a cohesive image from these separate pieces. Another strategy filmmakers have used is a combination of slightly altering the story and recasting. Can I ask you a question? Do you dream? Or should I say, can you put a price on your dreams? When Heath Ledger passed away in 2008, he was in the middle of shooting the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Rather than reshoot Ledger's work or remix and repurpose what they had already shot, Terry Gilliam was able to use different actors to portray Ledger's character when the character slipped into the imagination world. In this case, he used Ledger's friends Johnny Depp, Jude Law, and Colin Farrell. The tragedy of Heath Ledger's death made us have to think very seriously for a moment as whether we continue the film or whether we start rewriting and make even a better film. What are you talking about? <laughs> you can't even run away! You can't even run away from what? You want to run away from this? It's a really positive demonstration to me of the, the kind of community of film and it seemed fitting that Heath's work was respected and continued. Hey, I got a fun idea. Why don't we just go watch the grown-ups for a while? Come on. Several television shows have had to deal with death. A famous example occurred on the beloved children's show Sesame Street. In 1982, Will Lee, who played the character Mr. Hooper, passed away. On a now famous episode, Goodbye Mr. Hooper, the adult characters on Sesame Street must explain to Big Bird what has happened. Mr. Hooper died. He's dead. Oh yeah, I remember. Well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. When, when people die, they don't come back. Ever? No, never. The adults must then help him understand. We can all be very happy that we had a chance to be with him and to know him yeah. and to love him a lot. It's a beautiful example of the death of a character coming to inform the shape of the show itself. In this case, the death of Lee is used by the show as a learning experience. It's used to further the show's own mission and purpose to educate children about all aspects of the world, both happy and sad and that wrestling with an array of emotions in the wake of death is natural and a part of life. The death of some characters have not only led to rewrites of episodes, but they've also changed the entire trajectories of shows. Perhaps the most well-known example is the death of John Spencer, who played White House Chief of Staff Leo McGarry on The West Wing. By the show's final season, Leo was chosen to be the vice presidential running mate to the Democratic presidential candidate Matthew Santon, Spencer passed away during the filming of the final season, and so he occasionally pops up on the campaign trail, but plays a limited role in the final episodes, far less than viewers of the show would expect such a major character to play. That's because the show's creators had to sparse out what little footage they had of Leo throughout the season. Leo? Leo? Somebody help me! Spencer's death is incorporated into the show, in the timeline of the West Wing, Leo dies off-screen on election night, never knowing that he had been elected Vice President of the United States. In the show's original ending, Santos and McGarry were not supposed to win the election. However, after Spencer's death, the writers considered the emotional toll that would put not just on the audience, but also on the character of Santos, having lost both his running mate and the election. The writers thought that a victory needed to happen. Up until his death, the Republican was going to win the election. Jimmy Smits would be defeated, and that wonderful actor Alan Alda would win. But with John's death, they said no, and against history, the Democrats would continue. One final example comes from another classic television show, The Sopranos. In between seasons two and three, Nancy Marchand, who played Tony Soprano's mother, Livia, died in 2000. Few characters were as important to the show as Livia. After all, she was more or less the reason her son was in therapy. And it was Livia who laid the groundwork for Tony's attempted assassination at the end of the first season. Similar to The West Wing, the creators of The Sopranos wrote Marchand's death into the show. However, they first gave Tony one last chance to say goodbye. 
In an early example of CGI, the creators compiled footage of Marchand as Livia from previous seasons, blending them together to give Mrs. Soprano a final few moments on screen. Now look here, I don't like that kind of talk. Watching the footage now, one can see how young CGI technology still was, and how the use of such technology was a harbinger of things to come. She died between seasons and they made the decision to you know, have one last scene with uh, CGI Livia, which yeah, Chase even David regrets, Chase rightfully says so. is a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. Many other TV shows and films have dealt with a similar dilemma, finding different ways to cope and move forward. When it comes to Black Panther, there seems to be a divide. Fans created a viral petition amassing over 60,000 signatures with the desire to keep Black Panther around as opposed to retiring him. And in a storyline that involves multiverses and multiverse character variants, maybe there's a way that Marvel can have its cake and eat it too. It just felt like it was much too soon to recast. Stan Lee always said that Marvel represents the world outside your window, and we had talked about how, as extraordinary and fantastical as our characters and stories are, there's a relatable and human element to everything we do. The world is still processing the loss of Chad, and Ryan poured that into the story. The conversations were entirely about, yes, what do we do next? And how could the legacy of Chadwick and what he had done to help Wakanda and the Black Panther become these incredible, aspirational, iconic ideas continue? That's what it was all about. A way to honor Chadwick Boseman might be by actually following his own wishes for the character. Apparently, in his final days, he told close friends and family, I want people to see the role and not see me. That is the job of an actor. Where it's not about me, it's about the role. And people remember the role. So, how will Black Panther and the MCU move forward in the wake of Bozeman's death? Only time will tell. <laughs>